movimenta, a estrela vai estar se aproximando ou se afastando conforme ela orbita a, a outra estrela do sistema binário, conforme o planeta orbita ela. Então, para a gente medir uma velocidade radial confiável, a gente tem que medir ela várias vezes para uma mesma estrela e ver que isso não está variando no tempo por causa de uma binária não conhecida ou por causa de um planeta, por exemplo. E nesse caso, tem um planeta atrapalha, mas isso também é utilizado para detectar planetas em outras estrelas. E aí, juntando isso tudo, a gente é capaz de conhecer o movimento da estrela na nossa galáxia. Então, é, só para dar um exemplo, aqui seria o movimento do Sol seria parecido com esse aqui. Ele teria um movimento quase circular na galáxia, mas algumas estrelas não têm um movimento circular. É, é mais uma coisa desse tipo. Aqui está a trajetória que uma estrela, essa estrela aqui faria em torno da nossa galáxia. E ele fica subindo e descendo em relação ao plano da nossa galáxia. Então é uma órbita um pouco diferente da órbita dos planetas, porque é, a massa está distribuída de uma forma diferente. Quando a gente olha a órbita do planeta, a massa está toda no centro. No caso da estrela, tem todas essas estruturas contribuindo. Mas a gente consegue calcular essa, essa trajetória. Então, basicamente, é, além das idades das abundâncias, a gente também precisa conhecer posições de velocidade para saber qual a estrutura que essa estrela pertence e entender qual é o papel dela na evolução da nossa galáxia. Então, só para terminar, eu vou falar alguns exemplos. Eu, é, eu tirei isso da minha tese. Um dos capítulos foi justamente falar da evolução química e dinâmica da nossa galáxia, usando idades estelares. E eu vou só mostrar o que alguns resultados do meu estudo. É, eu fiz as coisas separadas também, depois eu juntei. Primeiro, eu estudei a distribuição das idades, então eu verifiquei para uma amostra de estrelas próximas do Sol que a gente tem uma população jovem e uma população antiga, calculando as idades com aquele método que eu expliquei. É, eu estudei a distribuição das velocidades das estrelas. Isso aqui mostra que as estrelas mais jovens, que estão aqui em azul, têm órbitas mais circulares, que é quando está mais perto de zero esses valores, e tem órbitas mais elípticas, mais afastadas das órbitas circulares, quando essas estrelas são mais velhas, aqui em vermelho. É, eu analisei em conjunto a idade e o movimento das estrelas, mostrando também, através de outros parâmetros, que as órbitas das estrelas mais jovens são mais próximas de circular. Por exemplo, a excentricidade da órbita é menor para as estrelas mais jovens. Uh, eu usei a composição química também, em relação à posição das estrelas, para mostrar que as estrelas que têm menor quantidade de metais vêm de regiões mais distantes da nossa galáxia, o Sol estaria aqui, então essas estrelas que têm menos quantidade de metais vieram de regiões mais afastadas do Sol. Eu estudei a evolução química dos elementos, a partir das abundâncias químicas que são medidas com aquela técnica de espectroscopia e das idades, como estava variando a, a abundância de cada um desses elementos químicos. E eu também juntei isso tudo num, no mesmo gráfico, estudando a evolução dos elementos químicos em função da excentricidade, que tem a ver com o movimento da estrela, e em função da idade, mostrando, por exemplo que é, os elementos químicos são mais abundantes, os elementos químicos produzidos pelas estrelas de alta massa são mais abundantes nas estrelas mais velhas. Isso aqui significa que esse processo de explosão de estrelas de maior massa acontecia com mais importância para a evolução química geral no passado. Era mais, mais relevante a evolução das estrelas de alta massa quando a nossa galáxia estava se formando. Hoje em dia isso não contribui tanto. No caso das estrelas de baixa massa, acontece o contrário. Então, a evolução química hoje é muito mais um resultado das estrelas de baixa massa do que das estrelas de alta massa. Então, é um estudo que combina tudo isso que eu falei num único gráfico para chegar numa determinada conclusão. Isso aqui seria o, o que a gente considera de é, arqueologia galáctica. Então, só concluindo aqui, né, é, o que é arqueologia galáctica? Então, é o estudo da evolução da nossa galáxia usando as estrelas como registros fósseis. A gente tem desafios, que são as limitações de tempo e espaço, que a gente tem que vencer é, determinando idades para as estrelas, para vencer o do tempo e determinando as posições, movimentos das estrelas, para a gente conseguir vencer as limitações de espaço. É, existem diversas formas de medir as idades das estrelas. Uma delas é a comparação dos dados que a gente observa com o que a gente prevê por modelos computacionais. Além disso, as estrelas elas são responsáveis pela produção de praticamente todos os elementos químicos que a gente vê no universo. E a gente pode estudar a distribuição das estrelas medindo as distâncias e as velocidades delas e a gente consegue entender o movimento delas na galáxia.
Então a gente junta isso tudo, a gente consegue estudar a evolução química e a evolução dinâmica da nossa galáxia. Basicamente é isso. Desculpa, mas a gente está só com, com esse microfone. É, perguntas? Ninguém tem pergunta? Nessas simulações da evolução das galáxias, né, como é que se trabalha com o aspecto da, da energia escura? Né? Assume-se algo como constante ou ela tem alguma variação hipotética? Como é que é feita essa parte? Bom, eu não sou especialista em simulação de galáxias. Mas a energia escura em si, ela não interfere tanto. A energia escura ela tá, é um processo que está mais é, evidente quando a gente compara diferentes galáxias se afastando entre si. A gente sabe que o universo está em expansão e que a, a distância entre as galáxias está aumentando com o tempo. A energia escura é o que a gente usa para explicar de onde vem essa energia que está fazendo o universo se expandir. Mas dentro de uma galáxia, o que vale...
And this is here. That's all right. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. I have to. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. I'll okay. <laughs> make sure I'm not. Yep. I cannot move. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thanks, Richard. Uh, good afternoon. Ah, okay. Uh, I know it's after lunch, everybody's sleepy. But uh, <laughs> we are here to have a very nice talk by uh, Professor Petty Kostokova. Kostokova. And uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to have you here for this talk. Uh, I will speak your, uh, your CV in Portuguese for them. Bom, a professora a professora Kova, na verdade, fez a sua, sua graduação em Ciência da Computação, né, em Praga, e depois fez seu doutorado na Universidade de uh, College, em London. Tá? Ela tem ela vem trabalhando, né, já trabalhou na Organização Mundial da, da Saúde por muitos anos, depois ela passou para a Universidade de College de London. Ela tem uh, vem trabalhando na parte de uh, saúde digital, né? É, como vocês podem ver, ela é diretora atualmente do Centro de, eh, Digital de Saúde Pública e Emergências de Londres. Uh, já foi uh, considerada, pra, numa lista curta, como a mulher uh, do ano, né, na parte de ciências de computação, na Inglaterra. Também publicou mais de 200 artigos uh, científicos, né, papers, uh, uh, livros uh, e outros. Então, tem um currículo fantástico. Né? Nós estamos aqui ela junto com, com a Rose e comigo, nós estamos, temos um projeto submetido é, para a FAPESP, né, no Belmont Forum, exatamente para estudar um pouco essa parte de saúde é, e impactos da Zika, né, considerando o cenário de mudanças climáticas. Bom, well, well, it's a really a pleasure to have you here, and uh, the stage is yours. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much for the um, introduction in Portuguese. Now I know what I've been doing all my life. Like <laughs> <laughs> so, I just flew in today. We landed in the morning, so I'm a bit jet lagged. So, uh, but I'm sure it's going to be all right. Um, if you have any questions, just feel free to ask during the talk. Don't wait until the end because I'm covering a different topic. So, it would make more sense to ask during the talk. And it's a very informal room, so I would welcome questions anytime. So, um, so as you know, I do digital health. Um, which basically means using computers or mobile technology, big data, in the aid of health, specifically public health and populational health. So my projects are sort of spreading across different uh, uh, dimensions of digital health. And well, we all know that you know we are using mobile phones. Is there anyone who hasn't got a mobile phone with you? you know, oh, yeah. <laughs> So mobile phones have been not just uh, an entertainment and connection device, but they also have been increasingly used for health. And people are checking their information, they can contact their GP, they can search for symptoms they may have. They can also um, obviously use information for surveillance, like we're using in the Zika project, which Tertio mentioned uh, in uh, Pernambuco in Brazil. It's not, not also um, the, uh, the mobile phone, but it's also additional devices we all are using, which are connected using Internet of Things into the Internet, which can transmit any data. It could be wearable, it could be your tracking device, your sports app. Are you using sports app for running or for fitness? Exactly. So this is all recording your information, your physiology, the time, your speed, and this is being created. Uh, and saved on the cloud and could be obviously used for yourself, but also it could feed into public health intervention and understanding what people actually physically do. So what we are um, working on kind of in general is using, well, this big data is just a buzzword, right? What's big data in Portuguese? Grande data. <laughs> so, yeah. Big data. Yeah, yeah. So, it's a buzzword, so you know how big is big data? Everyone asks, and what exactly is part of big data, which wasn't part before. So a lot of the things, the way we understand it, is basically looking at data which is constantly being streamed. So like data from your apps, data from your uh, Apple Watch or from your Fitbits, data coming from Internet of Things and transmitting uh, information pretty much 24 by 7 all the time. So the volume of the data is massive. It's not just a, a bit bigger database. So 
the challenges for storing, for analyzing, for data science on the big data is really challenging. So what we are trying to look at is how do we actually make any sense of this data? What is the questions we want to answer? So turning it into smart data and having some actionable decisions, like I will explain we are um, implementing in, in Pernambuco on the Zika project, where the professionals can actually direct their resource based on predictions we make using uh, real-time big data can actually help. Otherwise, we're just storing more and more data. So I will uh, cover several challenges and they're all linked into different projects we work on uh, at UCL. Um, so the first one is looking at um, news and diseases and online searches. Well, we all know what fake news are, right? And there's loads of fake news on, um, obviously, on diseases before fake news became a political phenomenon. So infections and outbreaks are really, really popular, especially with like the Sun and the right-wing press in, in the UK. They all cover which celebrity got a disease and how swine flu is spreading and all these scary stories are really popular, especially with the tabloid movie, which unfortunately are informing public and often scaring public about something which may not be as important or definitely not providing information which is um, evidence-based and public-based. So we all have to kind of realize the how the political issue of big data is just the same as the health of fake data or incorrect data. And as scientists and professionals, we have to be able to understand what people are getting and try to fight it. So we, um, we tried to look at a couple of years ago what people are searching um, when they were using our project in the UK. It was called Bugs and Drugs. It was a government funded project and it was educating a public about antibiotic resistance. And now we do a lot of work on antibiotic resistance. It's a big phenomenon now. And when the drugs we have, antibiotics are no longer becoming effective because the drugs become resistant and we are sort of facing a danger of uh, going back to the pre-antibiotics era. But at the time, it was 10 years ago, it actually wasn't a big uh, public um, term. So the government funded this project called Bugs and Drugs to explain people that they, that they, don't, they don't need antibiotics for coughs and colds and it's um, something which is often overused and overprescribed. And then we were looking at what people are actually searching when they come to this website about antibiotic resistance and antibiotics. And what do you think people were actually searching? What was the most common keyword um, you would expect people would search on Google or search engines which brought people to this antibiotics uh, website? Flu headaches, good idea, yes. What else? Something really surprising, which you wouldn't necessarily associate with antibiotics, but something you would not necessarily ask your GP or your doctor if you are prescribed antibiotics. <laughs> so we're getting some answers from the internet. <laughs> so any, any other ideas? What, what you would kind of want to know in relation to antibiotics, but wouldn't necessarily ask your doctor? Yeah, so you would go on the internet. Any, any suggestion? It's alcohol. Most of the words, most of the words which people were searching were alcohol and antibiotics. So all these usual suspects obviously were there, like chest and flu and, uh, and headache, but antibiotics and alcohol, obviously can I drink if I am on antibiotics, was the, one of the most common questions people wanted to know. So I'm sure like Brazilians would also want to know if they can have a caipirinha if they're taking antibiotics. <laughs> so, so that's the kind of questions that a lot of users would not ask their GP, but actually they uh, wanted to know. So we have to expand the sections about uh, which antibiotics you're not allowed to drink and which you can. And so there was a lot of kind of interesting um, expansion of the project as a result of understanding what people are actually searching. So, and some words included the word cat. You just say, why cat? You know, there was nothing about um, animal health in, it, it was purely human health and antibiotics. We thought like, what's going on with the cats? <laughs> and so, so we actually deep searched what are the pages which were uh, listed on Google where people ended up um, searching for cats. And we discovered uh, actually, it's nothing to do with cats. It's just a misindexing by Google. Because we have a, kind of a content about a lot of um, topics and we point to the user, if they want to learn some more, there is an Oxford University-based project called Critically Appraised Topics. 
which was a medical project providing kind of lay language uh, database for people to understand medical conditions. So we, list, we linked to this project a lot to give people additional information about the terms we didn't cover in full detail. So there was a link to the CAT, critically appraised topic, which was abbreviated in like big capital letters, but obviously it was indexed by Google as cats. So poor pet owners were landing on this antibiotics page thinking, what on earth am I doing here? Some people also were writing like full sentences, you know, quit working and quit antibiotics and animals. So a lot of interesting um, results came out of trying to understand what people actually search when they are on the internet. And because we have been running this, the server, we, we had the, the logs, we could actually search the information. At the moment, it's only Google and the search engines and Bing who have access to the logs to actually understand what people are really searching. So we also um, looked at, uh, in more detail, what public and professionals were actually searching on the internet when it came down to um, some important uh, medical um, events, like early warning for diseases. And we look at what people were searching on a professional website, Nelly and Enric, and we look at Google for public, and also we look at Guardian website about the news. And we just thought, actually, are people searching the same things when it comes to major diseases or um, events? So for example, uh, MRSA, which is the, it's called superbug in the public language, it's the multi-resistant Staphylococcus aureus is a common word, but it was actually searched a lot because there was loads of superbug uh, discussions as the uh, antibiotic wasn't becoming effective in many patients in the UK. So news was the green one, loads of coverage in the, in over the like 10 years we looked at it. The red one is the professionals, and you can say the professionals have been searching at the end a lot, but it doesn't actually match any public, uh, any media discussion about, uh, about the superbug. And you can say the Google has been kind of fluctuating um, again, it's normalized, right? So the Google was obviously higher in terms of numbers, it was fluctuating. Some, some of these uh, media coverages were actually not met by public being interested, some of it, some of it was. The, the downturns in the Google searches was usually about Christmas, when people have, have, their, have their Christmas dinners and stop searching the internet. So it was interesting to find out what, the, what these black downturns are. So it was nothing really kind of major in terms of the correlation. But when we look specifically in uh, 2009, which was the swine flu year, when the swine flu was a pandemic, you could see there was a massive coverage um, in terms of the news, the green one. But interesting result it was the, the Google searches, the public searches, the black was actually preceding it. So people initially started searching for the symptoms and wanted to know more about swine flu before media jumped in and started publishing all these tabloid information. So it's interesting to know what is influencing. Is it the public or is it actually the media driving the public need and interest? And at the time in 2009, in the pandemic, we also look at Twitter. It was a time when Twitter was starting, many companies didn't have Twitter, presidents didn't use Twitter. You know. <laughs> so it was something which was really just kind of more geeky, more kind of young people were at, on Twitter at the time. Um, so we thought it's kind of Twitter also some kind of big, big data media which could be used for predicting epidemics. And uh, what is the relationship between Twitter and people tweeting things and media publishing stories about the spine flu? So during this year we analyzed Twitter data and the news aggregated data and you can see there were kind of some days there were big highlights on the news, some days there was a peak on Twitter, but they were pretty much in line. So it wasn't the social media affecting the public, uh, the, the, the uh, newspapers, nor the other way around. And we also looked at what Twitter was doing in this day, 11th of June 2009. That was the most important day during the swine flu pandemic. And what happened? Um, WHO declared that swine flu is pandemic. And as you, as you may know, there was a big criticism that it was premature decision. It wasn't as severe as the uh, people were worried about, and it's just kind of created a lot of drama and a lot of fear. So there were a lot of discussions about if this decision was right or wrong, and experts believe it was perhaps wrong. But uh, nevertheless, um, WHO um, Director General, uh, Dr. Chen, uh, declared on 11th of June that swine flu has now reached the highest level, level six of danger and its international pandemic. Well, what happened on Twitter interests us. You thought, like, is that actually going to be something being picked up? So, yes, 
the word pandemic was trending on Twitter all day. It was the highest occurring word in the entire season. Um, but we look at what about the media covering this big story? And uh, there was not much happening on Twitter for the first four hours, and when WHO declared it. And then we specifically look at people tweeting certain news uh, links in relation to this pandemic declaration. So when CNN reported it, the red line, people started picking it up and tweeting it and retweeting the CNN coverage. And when, when BBC um, uh, reported it, which was the slide before, immediately BBC got the highest uh, Twitter presence. And most people have continued retweeting uh, BBC for 24 hours afterwards. It was interesting that people wouldn't necessarily go to WHO website and retweet it because they may not follow WHO account. I don't, I don't even know if they actually had a Twitter account at the time, uh, but uh, they obviously did follow BBC. So kind of working with more reputable media, especially international media, is quite important for educating public in risk communication like this. So CDC in the US, they would, you can see their second. They were also very, very low presence on Twitter. And like ECDC, the European Center of Disease Prevention, they didn't even make it to the graph. There were like a, one or two tweets on their sort of website covering it. So it's the news media we have to work with, as we know. <coughs> so mosquitoes in Brazil. So one of our projects, uh, and that's why I'm, I'm actually here. I'm flying to uh, Recife from, uh, from Sao Paulo, is investigating the Zika virus. And as you know, obviously better than I do, Zika virus is a it's endemic in, in tropical parts of Brazil and Central America uh, and also in, in Asia, and uh, it's a mosquito-borne disease. Um, so a lot of um, prevention and information needs to go in to protect people from mosquitoes and, and try to control the transmission and, uh, and spreading of mosquitoes. So we work in two cities, in Recife and Campina Grande. Uh, in, um, in a Paraíba and, and in Pernambuco, with the public health authorities and universities trying to control um, the mosquito presence. And what they do, they basically visit houses and they look at the danger of hotspots for mosquitoes. And if there is standing water, as you know, they kind of destroy the mosquitoes like chemically uh, to make sure they can't spread and infect humans. So a lot of kind of manual work and data collection is going on in those high-risk areas to protect the humans from uh, from being infected by mosquitoes. So what we're doing is we develop a mobile app where the healthcare agents visiting the properties can actually record the data uh, about the presence of the mosquitoes using the app. So the data will be collected in real time as opposed to on a paper, which is still uh, what is the system now. And also this can feed into, uh, into early warning and prediction. So in, in the systems we are developing, and hopefully this is gonna be a big three years project, as you, as you have heard from Tercio, we're applying for understanding how the mosquitoes are actually spreading in relation to global, global warming and what is the kind of future uh, danger for areas which now haven't got any mosquito presence, but maybe in 10, 20 years time, they could also have Zika endemic. So it is becoming a much more global problem than it is now as a result of the um, environmental changes. So at the moment, we basically have got the historical data which we collected by these organizations in those two cities. And we uh, developed a model to see how mosquitoes population is being spread in relation to weather and rain, et cetera, and also uh, how the data from the population uh, surveillance is feeding into it. In the future, we also would like to use like citizens who have an app for citizens who can also report mosquito in their houses or who can report standing water, which could be a danger. So at the moment, it's just the professionals uh, in, the, in this project, but in the future, it will be both the kind of crowdsource information from public as well as the professionals. And it feeds into the model, and the model is being, during this app data, kind of calibrated on a real-time basis. So we can predict where there are likely occurrence of mosquitoes, so the agents can direct their resources and go there and control the mosquitoes, as opposed to finding them by random, as they do now. And also, we will calibrate the system. If we had a false positive, we will know from the app data that there are no mosquitoes, so it will be continually recalibrated. So it's really exciting really exciting project going on up there. Technically, for those of you who are interested, so we have a big um, uh, MongoDB database which stores all the big data, and the MongoDB obviously is in a cloud and it communicates with uh, Ionic app, and the Ionic app is what we have been using for the agents. So it's a really it's kind of a simple app which replicates the paper form they have, and the data are being stored in the back end. 
and being analyzed um, in a, on a, a real-time basis. The agents also are getting some additional functionality on the app. So for example, they have to visit properties in the city and they're going to get a map which is routing the best route among the properties they have to visit today. So it's helping their job as well as making it kind of electronic data collection. This is what, what the app looks like. So you can see a city and then they can go in, the, go in the property they have to visit and fill in all the data about the presence of mosquito and quality of the dwelling, if it's a favela or, or an other house. So all this data will be collected uh, seamlessly using the mobile app. So that's what, that's what I'm doing in the, in the next two weeks. So I'm flying up there. And we hope to be able to finish this project next year. And if there's an ex extension, I think we're going to be in Brazil quite often in over the next three years. So um, the other part of our work is looking at serious games and games analytics. So who doesn't play games? Everyone does, yeah. <laughs> so everyone likes some kind of games. So we actually do two projects in games, completely different audience. So the first one is a project for kids, as you can see from the images. And it was the biggest public health European project in 10 countries in Europe, teaching kids about, uh, about microbes. So they have a little kind of uh, cartoon images which resemble the actual microbiological shape and size of the bug. We have fantastic artists who look at the microscope images and drew it like a cartoon. And also we have got you know, ideas about teaching kids about where bugs are, or they're in a the kitchen, they could be in your body. And, um, and we have the, um, two games. One was aimed at, uh, at like primary school children, and one was aimed at like uh, teenage children. This is from the, the, the junior game. And unfortunately, the, uh, the animation doesn't work. So it's, uh, you, you have to visualize it. But like the, um, this, the, the avatar, this is, the, is it a girl or a boy? There's a girl in this picture. She can jump around. So it's a platform game. And like in this level, she has to jump on the uh, piece of either the sausage or the bread. And uh, you can change it if you we have got an editor for changing the objects in the kitchen. So if you want to make it more Brazilian, you can have patata frita there. But this is a UK. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a UK one. So you have a sausage and a bread, and then like there is a glass of milk, and like she has to push the green green bug, which is a lactobacillus. It, she has to push it into the glass of milk. And when she does it three times, she has to pu push three lucids into like the bacillus into the milk, it becomes yogurt. And then the kids actually were understanding that, yes, there are bugs which make you ill, but there are also bugs which actually we're using in our daily life to make bread and to make, uh, to make yogurt from milk. So this was really effective. The kids really understood after playing the game that there are actually some good bugs as well. And they enjoy pushing it and killing the bugs and fighting against them and all that. This is a different level. Again, you have to see the visualization uh, yourself. So you are. Um, here is the boys uh, standing, standing there on some kind of tissue inside your body. And there's this horrible purple infection in your body. And uh, you have got um, antibiotics. You can see this little capsule in the middle. And you have to throw antibiotics on this horrible purple super infection to kill it. And the, uh, the learning objective here is to teach the kids that they, they, sh they should finish the course as opposed to stop finishing it halfway through because th this is feeding into antibiotic resistance. So the idea is they, really, they, have, they have like five of these uh, little capsules and they have to throw the five onto the uh, infection to destroy it and then, then they get a point and they can move on. So if they only uh, three, four, it actually disappears but they don't get a point because it will reappear again and regrow and then, then they will lose points. So it is kind of rewarding them for really remembering they have to finish all the uh, antibiotic capsules to destroy the infection completely. So yeah, so there are more levels. So, the, so there are about 10 levels, each is teaching something else. And then the game for the older kids was using the CSI idea. So you're investigating like a case but it wasn't poli a police case, it was like an antibiotic case. So you call to investigate uh, some outbreak in a party and you need to in interview people and collect evidence, just like CSI. So, so the kids really liked it. And even the older kids actually <laughs> like playing this game. So you can imagine it's been a popular project. Well, it's not just kids who play game. Our other challenging project was working in Nepal. 
And as you know, Nepal is one of the poorest countries in the world, where a lot of people still haven't got you know, at the toilets and sort of basic facilities and live in very, very poor rural areas. Literacy is still an issue. And we, we work with women in rural Nepal, who some of them have got very basic education or couldn't even write. And then we were using mobile game to teach them about maternal health and neonatal health. And we thought, like, actually, is this going to work, really? You know, these are people who are not an audience of uh, mobile users. But actually, actually it, it did. So um, they kind of meet together and have a kind of women's kind of monthly groups where they work with um, women who are kind of educated about health. So they are basically being taught about primary health issues and health of their babies through women's groups like this, where they all meet up and have a discussion once a month. And then if they, are, if they need to go to a center, they may have to walk hours to get to like a little health center like this one on, on the right. And being transported to a hospital for many is not possible because it's just too far and the country is too mountainous to actually have kind of healthcare system which would support. So empowering them to better understand what is something they really need to try to seek help and what is actually okay, it's a normal condition in, around pregnancy is quite important. So we developed a game which was um, covering three modules, maternal health, neonatal health, and also geohazards. A lot of people during the, or after the earthquakes didn't die as a result of the actual earthquake, but they died because they slipped somewhere or because the stones fell on them. And so the geohazards in this country are really very, very dangerous. And obviously the requirements were, there can't be any text because a lot of them are illiterate. There shouldn't be any voice because they would have to be fiddling with the phone to turn the voice on and quite often this would be too difficult for them technically to do. And it must be completely intuitive. So we have come up with like a drag and drop and they were trained to do drag and drop by a picture of a woman and a baby which we took on the first visit. So they recognized the baby and the woman and this was disconnected and they were dragging the baby to the woman. So they kind of learned how to do drag and drop. And then they, uh, they played the game. It was entirely, entirely um, uh, pictogram based where the conditions were described as a picture. So they could kind of visualize this could be, you know, th their baby bleeding or this is a condition in pregnancy or giving birth has complications, etc. So we tested these images quite a lot with them to make sure they actually understood. And in the game, they just kind of do the drag and drop idea. They, they take the picture of, um, um, the condition, either the baby, the, the mother, or the geohazard, and they drag it to the ambulance if they think it's a high risk, something which is urgently requiring attention, or if it's something which is a normal complication but doesn't require um, a transfer to a medical facility, they just kind of drag it to the nurse. And the nurses often visit their villages even if they are remote or they are sort of health spot but that there are typically no facility to deal with, say, complicated birth. So the idea was to try to distinguish between high risk and low risk. And yeah, actually, surprisingly enough, it, it worked. We have a number of focus groups in three different villages, and the women were aged 20 to 60, and they basically found the game quite intuitive and enjoyed playing it. Um, and uh, yeah, these three conditions seem to be the most successful in terms of improving their knowledge before and after playing the game. And uh, we had a lot of focus group sort of feedback from, uh, from, from the women. Um, so for example, uh, they said, oh, you know, it's, do you wanna, do you wanna stop it? Is it enough of playing? And they were saying, no, I felt like playing more. And uh, we understood that it's useful for us all. So a lot of positive um, data came both from the actual analysis of the data in the game and how they learn, but also from the focus group where we spoke to them not, not me, it was like the, our, the NGO we work with in, uh, in Nepal because it was all in Nepalese. But um, actually it was interesting to get a transcript and see how an audience you would never think could, be, um, could benefit from uh, serious games and game based learning actually did. Yeah, and more, more women enjoyed it and uh, they were coming, like, they had to walk sometimes an hour or two to come to the, like, those meeting rooms where, they, where we actually met them and because they live in valleys, you know, up and down the uh, uh, quite scattered houses. So it was really good to see them actually coming to the next focus groups and really enjoying, enjoying the game time. So yeah, 
So it could be kids, it could be you, it could be women in Nepal, but we all enjoy playing games. <laughs> um, so our other project I'm going to cover briefly is it's in Nigeria. And this is a project, again, about antibiotic resistance. Uh, we are working with surgeons in Nigeria in three different hospitals, and we're developing a mobile app, which is doing decision support for prescribing antibiotics for surgeons. So what is recommended by WHO and Stanford guidelines, and how is it actually implemented on the ground, and if there is any opportunity to change their behavior. So a lot of kind of design and co-analysis went into it, focus groups with the local professionals. We developed it, and now we are deploying it. We're running six months trial to actually see how effective the game is. So I mentioned what antibiotic resistance is before. So this is just some scary figures about how important this problem is, just as much as a global warming for you know, international community to really direct resources to combating antibiotic resistance, because we all can start getting ill just like you know, 60 years ago before penicillin was invented, if it doesn't get resolved. So, um, so one of the issues with the, which the GASDA project is addressing is the overprescribing. So trying to reduce prescriptions when they are not necessary or when they are for too long, which is a major issue in the developing world. Just prescribe it for a week or even longer, even though it's not necessary. So as I mentioned, we have taken a sort of official guidelines from WHO about surgical prescribing. And we also have taken a Stanford guideline from the US, which are kind of the only ones they're actually using there. And uh, yeah, there's loads of prescription uh, evidence. And we turned them into uh, an app. We work in three different hospitals. We work in two are in Lagos, and one, one is in the Delta. And uh, they are, again, very, very basic hospitals. Um, most of them have got very little resources. The patients have to pay for the antibiotics. A lot of the decisions are actually quite complex. So it's not just the surgeon who decides. It's the patient kind of having a say whether they can or can't afford it. So it's a really challenging environment. The hospitals are so under-resourced. Some of them haven't got power all day. So like afternoon, the power is off because they are optimizing the power grid. So <laughs> it's, you know, it's, and it's a hospital, right? So it's a really, really challenging environment. However, yeah, we have kind of got a lot of feedback from them before we designed the app to see what actually they do and do they follow the guideline. If not, why not? So um, we did develop a decision tree based on, based on those guidelines, which actually tells them what the guidelines are saying. So is it a surgery which requires antibiotics or not? Is it low risk? You shouldn't prescribe. And then which antibiotics is recommended for the specific surgery? It could vary, it could differ depending on the patient. If it's a high risk patient, you prescribe something else. So basically, these complex guidelines have been turned into a decision tree by our computer science people on the project and implemented for each of uh, the surgery. We have like 60 different surgeries and each of the antibiotics. So the, 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 um, so the game is providing a decision support and it kind of gives feedback to the surgeon who say, well, I have this patient, I'm operating this, and like this is the antibiotic I am I'm about to prescribe. And we give a feedback and say, well, this is in line with WHO, this is a correct, so it's a green feedback, and it says it repeats what the decision is. Or if the decision isn't in compliance with um, WHO and Stanford guideline, we provide direct feedback with the red information saying this is basically wrong and why is it wrong. It was interesting why this dog is there, right? <laughs> Do you like the dog? <laughs> we actually thought, like, well, it's good in like serious game, a persuasive game, to have kind of a mentor, some figure the um, user associates with, which has got an authority. And we did like a big focus group about different like, feature, like human features, human mentors, and animals. And we thought they would naturally choose a human mentor. And we had a lot of discussion in our team. Are they going to choose men or women? It's a kind of a culture society. Would they, really, would they choose, say, a black man or woman as a mentor or white? Because there is all this, you know. So we had a lot of discussions about what the mentor would be like. And at the end, they've chosen a dog. <laughs> so, and they had so many ideas. Like the dog should like, wear you know, a white coat. 
is wearing white coat and the dog should have a glasses because doctors uh, have got a glasses if they're older and more senior. So they had a like, really, really interesting discussion about what the mentor would be appropriate for Nigerian surgeons. And this is what we get. So we would love to port it to different countries so because maybe in different countries you would have different um, expectations or visualizations of a kind of authority figure. So that's where the dog comes from. Yeah, and they're also getting badges and some kind of awards if they do X number of patients. If they change their decision, they can monitor if they are changing the decision to be more compliant. And um, we're having a competition between the three hospitals now. So we're telling which, which hospital is entering how many patients onto the system a week to get them uh, encouraged to do more. So, so it's really exciting. So we are in the middle of the evaluation period now. So it's going until Christmas and then we evaluate all the data. Yeah, so that's it. So um, this is just a slide about our center. So if you're interested to learn more about um, UCL IRVR Center for Digital Public Health in Emergencies, so that's us and that's our contact details. And, um, and before we finish, if you happen to be in Europe in November, uh, I'm chairing a Digital Public Health Conference in Marseille at the end of November. And uh, we have a very exciting program coming up, and uh, industries coming, and we have Students Day for, uh, for MSc PhD students. And obviously, the main conference is held in conjunction with a big public health conference. So that's going to be an exciting event. So you're all welcome to come to, come to uh, Marseille in uh, November. And I'd like to thank to um, all the teams, so my initial team at City University, my current team, and the people who work on these projects, because they're doing an amazing work, both in the UK, but also in those countries where we work. So thank you very much. Thank you. And it's time for questions. <laughs> Questions? Pode perguntar em português, eu traduzo para elas. Dúvidas? Do you want to translate if someone prefers ah, yes. to ask I, in, I, I in ask Portuguese? Yes, yeah. if they can ask in Portuguese. Uh, that game of pregnant uh, people, mm -hmm. uh, women. W uh, he asking. He's saying that uh, it seems that it's for to to old woman. Uh, have you done for the young one, for instance, in Brazil, uh, girls with uh, 14, 13 years old? So yeah, yeah. Pregnant. So, um, so it was for all women. In Nepal, it is the same. A lot of women get married before age 18 and have children. That's very culturally common. So um, it wasn't designed for old women. It was designed for any women. Any other question? Don't be shy. Don't be shy, exactly. <laughs> The health, uh, the public health system is so complex, and we need uh, many different uh, point of view. Uh, and for example, using the new technologies for these discussions and the games is fantastic the idea for the, the the people in all days. It's very fast or more uh, easier. I don't know, but. Uh, Maybe it's, dif it's difficult for our some questions because it's so difficult to think about. Mm -hmm. It's so new for yeah. me, this, this situation. It's so no, thank you very much. It's, thank it's you. really new. It's like cutting edge. So it's, it's something where the technology is really the way forward. So yeah, I do appreciate. It has little to do with meteorology. <laughs> uh, what do you think about other diseases like cardiovascular diseases, respiratory diseases that can be related to meteorological data? You can do this kind of uh, 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 APP? Well, um, 
So I personally don't work in cardiovascular disease. Yeah. Uh, we were more on the public health uh, where you have to treat the whole population. Mm. So cardiovascular is more clinical where you yeah. deal oh, each, each uh, individual patient yeah, separately. Uh, but obviously you can have apps and monitoring devices for any condition. Yeah, so I'm sure, uh, I'm sure there are loads of apps for cardiovascular patients and you know, what if there is any relationship between uh, meteorological conditions? Uh, yeah, I mean, even um, some Zika can be related to I mean, meteorological data. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. Uh, then can be associated with it. Uh, Absolutely. That's so the, uh, the idea for this proposal, yes. when we finish this current testing in Campina Grande and Recife, would be looking at the meteorological data and not, not just kind of the weather and climatic data, which is already feeding into the modeling, but looking at the kind of future trend for global warming and climatic changes and changes in biodiversity and all that, which will impact the mosquitoes. Will there be more mosquitoes or less if, we, if the temperature goes you know, much higher up? So all this kind of modeling would be absolutely relevant. That's why we have got a proposal together with Tercio, who has the expert in this. So you will have a plan to do that. To yeah. yeah. Yeah, uh, to add uh, meteorological data inside of uh, the APPs. Yeah, okay. More? And also on this question, we have like in, in the UCL team, we have three different, three professors in the UCL, and one is a professor of life science. So she's modeling the life science changes uh, in, in terms of like habitat and the the diversity of habitat in relation to weather and uh, those sort of conditions, um, environmental conditions and weather conditions. So there is a lot of kind of interest in modeling before you get to the human health, which needs to take place to understand the correlation. So it will be an exciting project to, <laughs> to work That's with true. you guys. <laughs> no? No, any more burning questions? Chikungunya, yeah. No one? No one? Uh, <gasps> no, even they. No. Oh, oh did you? They all fine. They all fine. Well, yeah. You are all, you, you're all very healthy. <laughs> Very healthy, yeah. Well, you know, the, the down here, down here, there are it, there are not enough mosquitoes, right? So I guess. Oh no, yes, there is. Where are they? It's cold here. It's colder than London. Uh, no. <laughs> no, no, during the winter. It's cold for mosquitoes. But in <laughs> spring and yeah, summer, yeah. it's really hot. When this app was uh, started, uh, the how you keep it man uh, maintaining during the time? That's a very, very good question. <laughs> very good question. So in the research projects, uh, it's really hard because the project finishes and then it's hard to keep it maintained. So for example, the Nepal project is not around because we haven't got funding to keep it going uh, forward, unfortunately. In, in the Zika uh, project, we are working with the local public health authorities and I'm also meeting the director of public health in Recife, who is very interested in adopting the technology and then using it uh, as a kind of as a, their collection of data method. So, with the local stakeholders in the country, it would be possible to keep it going like for a long time. Yeah. yeah depends do governo e do, dos projetos uh, yeah, para yeah. continuar o projeto precisa ter dinheiro para continuar os projetos, né? Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. 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 This kind of project that's linked to public health. Uh, Thank you. 
Mm. And do you have any uh, positive example of your projects in weather or meteorology forecasting, which is used by uh, the Brazilian uh, meteorology system or by your research actually has been adopted? Maybe it's easier mm. here than... <laughs> Uh, it's a good question as well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, most of our group works with uh, cyclone Atlant uh -huh. in the cyclones, uh, cyclones in the Atlantic. So some of the acknowledgement we have been having is because uh, we understand a little bit more how the cyclones goes by through the coast and uh, how it affects the, the climate and the, the streams and the weather over there. So uh, most of the National Institute of uh, Meteorology and other centers use some of this uh, acknowledged knowledge to apply during the operational uh, mm -hmm. work mm -hmm. during the day. Yeah. Could you describe how uh, group in more detail things you see mm. in uh, forecasting? Forecasting, yeah. yeah, yeah. So in my department, in a Institute of Risk and Disaster Reduction, there are a lot of people who are looking at natural disasters. Sure. So my group is investigating health and health emergencies, but there's a lot of research into earthquakes and volcanoes and uh, yeah, tsunamis. So, and also the technology could be equally applicable. We have early warning system for Zika and for danger of mosquitoes, but the modeling can also be fed into an app or which creates early warning system for people being born about a natural disaster or, or tsunami. So definitely yeah, the technology could be applied to anything. True. Here in the, the countryside, in the city, San Jose dos Campos, we have the National Center for Natural Disasters. Yeah. And they have some uh, weather alert or alerts for weather uh, streams. Uh, mm. Yeah. And w we work close with them mm -hmm. sometimes. Mm -hmm. OK. So uh, thank you again. For thank you very much. Talk. By the way, what we have Thank here is lots of graduation students, PhDs uh -huh. and masters, and uh, also some uh, lectures from the department. Excellent. Thank you very much. Obrigada. <laughs>